Good evening, everyone from the FCC in Hong Kong. Welcome to the latest in our series of Zoom Talks. I'm Rebecca Bailey. Before I introduce our distinguished guest from London this evening, I just want to flag another event happening this week. That's Bei Fang, president of Radio Free Asia on Thursday at 8 p.m. That will be a fascinating one, so please do tune in for that as well. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, Fuchsia Dunlop. She is a cook and food writer specializing in Chinese cooking. She trained as a chef at the Sichuan Higher Institute of Cuisine in the 1990s and has been researching Chinese food and culinary culture for more than two decades. Fuchsia is the author of six books about Chinese cuisine, including the critically acclaimed memoir Shark's Fin and Sichuan Pepper, and most recently, The Food of Sichuan, which is actually a revised and updated version of her landmark work, Sichuan Cooking, which was released 20 years ago. You may well recognize her from appearances on radio and TV. She's been on Anthony Baudin's Parts Unknown. She's been on David Chang's Ugly Delicious and the Chinese documentary series Once Upon a Bite. Her works received numerous awards, including from the James Beard Foundation and the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Now, anyone who's ever used Fisher's re recipes will know they can utterly transform your cooking game. Though I did actually once get a bit too ambitious with my wok and almost caused a fire evacuation for an entire block of Glasgow flats. You'll be pleased to know there's no danger of that with our wonderful chefs from the FCC, who to mark this event, as you can see, we're doing things a bit differently tonight. They are serving three Sichuan specials from Fisher's cookbooks just today and tomorrow, so do make sure you sample them. And I think we'll be sampling them tonight as well, which I'm very much looking forward to. Your moderator tonight is Keith Richberg, who needs no introduction. He's the president of the FCC. I'm sure you're all very familiar with him. And just before we begin, a reminder, you can submit questions to question at fcchk.org. I'll be passing them on to ask Keith to tell Fusha. So please, over to you. Well, thank you very, very much for that, uh, Rebecca. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you for uh, uh, letting people know that the FCC chefs have gone through Fuchsia's cookbooks and have made a couple of the delicacies here that we'll be discussing tonight, and they're right here in front of us. But Fuchsia, thank you so much for joining us from London. We're really excited to have you here. A lot of people have been already asking me questions. They couldn't believe we got you in. They're thinking, oh my God, how did you get Fuchsia Dunlop? We really we really want to know more about kind of, you know, how you came up with these these dishes and 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 how you can make them and how you can create them. So first of all, thank you for joining us. And uh, really, the first question I have for you is you're in London now, right? You're in lockdown. Is that correct? Exactly. What, <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what do you do uh, for your craving for Sichuan food when you're in lockdown in London? Do you just throw things together in the kitchen or can you go out or do you do, do you have food panda or home delivery or what's going on? Well, um, all the restaurants are still closed, tragically, but as anyone who follows my Instagram account um, can see, um, my way of coping with lockdown and the pandemic has been just cooking like a maniac for months. And I have just been, um, you know, uh, I've been missing China and I've been missing friends and missing restaurants. And I have just been cooking in a quite deranged fashion sometime. Recently, I've been, um, um, I went out on a foraging walk with this extraordinary man in East London called John the Poacher and was managing to pick um, um, mallows, which were a sort of, um, um, ancient ch ancient Chinese vegetable, which is still eaten in Sichuan and making them into soups. <laughs> yeah, so I <laughs> you know, coping strategy. Well, great. Uh, we, you know, before we try these wonderful dishes, we have to ask a little bit of background here. I mean, what is it that first drew you to Sichuan cooking and Chinese food? I mean, you were, you, I mean, you were one of the first, the only, the first Westerner to actually go to Sichuan to learn cooking, but what drew you to it in the first place? Well, so I've always been a keen cook and I can remember when I was 11 years old telling a middle school teacher that I wanted to be a chef when I grew up. <laughs> so um, my okay. mother's a great cook and I grew up in a house full of quite adventurous food. Um, and then, you know, in my teens, I was cooking seriously. And by the time I left university, I did English literature, but I knew I wanted to travel and I knew I wanted to do something with food. 
Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up applying to it for a British Council scholarship to study in China, having learned Mandarin in evening classes for, for a year or so. And um, one of the reasons that I chose Sichuan was that I had visited it the previous year backpacking and eaten the most amazing Chinese food of my life. I wanted to go off the beaten track. I wanted to go and spend a year in China, but really get to know the country and not just go for the easy expat option in Beijing or Shanghai. Um, and yeah, I've had a couple of really captivating meals in 1993 in Chengdu. <laughs> and on that trip, I had felt something about Chengdu, which made me make an inner commitment to go back and live there. I just thought this is the place. So I applied for my scholarship and I came up with all these academic reasons, but actually I was thinking about the food, not professionally. And then of course, when I arrived in Sichuan, like all my foreign student classmates, we just fell in love with the place and the food. And one of the things about Sichuanese cuisine is that, you know, it's a very it's renowned as a very popular style. It's not always very expensive. There were little noodle shops and so-called fly restaurants around the university that were very affordable for students and they were serving Chinese food that was better and fresher and more vibrant and exciting than anything I'd had in London. Um, mm. And so I just started cooking very informally. I mean, I have my notebooks from literally my first week there in Chengdu and I'm writing down what food was being sold in the market, um, meals that I was eating. And then I started sort of collecting recipes from, from friends and so on. <laughs> Well, it's great. Well, what was it like 1990s in China? Okay, I was in Hong Kong then. And I remember going to Beijing. And if you look like me, people stared at you and they kind of, you know, didn't know where you were from. You Maybe you were from Mars or outer space. Sichuan, Chengdu was even more in those days remote. Uh, they didn't know a lot of Westerners and you show up. How were you treated? What was the what was it like? What was the experience like? I mean, a, a bit like your experience in the sense that there were very, I mean, I think there were just a couple of hundred foreigners in this large provincial city. Um, and so we attracted a lot of attention. And I can remember sort of just cycling down the street and people would stop what they were doing and shout, actually shout hello or something often. And people were very friendly, but there was great curiosity about us. Um, and, and also, you know, as a foreigner, I was very curious about China. So um, I think most people who go to Chengdu find it a particularly friendly part of China. People are famously laid back and warm and hilarious. Um, and so, yeah, and it was just it was a period when China was just beginning to open up. Um, so there was a real sense of change and possibility. And so there were all these things happening like many of the Chinese people that I met had never interacted with foreigners before. So it, there were lots of misunderstandings and jokes. It was great fun. And also <laughs> Chengdu, you know, Chengdu at that stage, I mean, Chengdu, like many parts of China, has been totally redeveloped in the last 20 or 30 years. But in the 1990s, there were still whole areas of the city um, where the cityscape was something that was almost like you see in that famous Song Dynasty painting, Qingming Shanghetu, like these one or two story houses built of wood and bamboo, um, winding lanes with um, all these craftspeople. So there were elderly men who were sewing those abusia, the cotton shoes. There were um, people making silken and cotton quilts. Um, there were all kinds of, you know, there were a couple of street vendors who had duck ovens where they were roasting ducks and hanging them out to dry. And so it was just absolutely enchanting. And also Chengdu has this particular tea house culture. And so practically every street had a tea house. And there were all sorts of different tea houses. So some of them, you'd have people gathering to play Sichuan opera. Um, there would be others which were more touristic in the parks. Um, there were some that were a bit sort of um, had a slightly, um, you know, gangstery feel about them, you know, <laughs> slightly yeah. racist. Them. And it was just sort of, um, it was just, yeah, and there were medicine shops where they would measure out all the herbs with handheld scales. So it was just sort of a place that, like most of my classmates, I mean, we all just totally fell in love with. And, and Sichuan food is obviously is known for being spicy. It's known for the la and the ma. I mean, when you first got there, 
were you used to that on the tongue or did it take some time to get used to that? Well, I mean, look, the first thing to say is that Sichuanese food is famous for being very spicy, but actually it has many dishes that are not so spicy. And so even if you have a dish that's really mala, numbing and hot, on the same table, you'll probably have something that's yu xiang wei, you know, that sort of gentle fish fragrant flavor, pickled chilies, a bit of sweet and sour. Wow. You'll have stir fried vegetables that are not hot at all. You'll always have a very light soup. And so it was, um, some of the dishes were very hot, but even in Chengdu, I mean, Chongqing is where you go for the seriously blow your head off mala food. Chengdu was always a bit gentler. And so, um, you know, some dishes were spicy, but um, overall it was just very congenial and very seductive and mm. utterly delicious really. Yeah. Well, 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 our FCC kitchen obviously can, can, can perform miracles because we've got these beautiful dishes in front of us. But talk to me a bit about home chefs, amateurs, people. Well, I'm not much of a home chef, but talk about home chefs. Chinese food in general, we have this, you know, we have this image in our mind. It's very difficult to make Chinese food at home. There's a lot of chopping. There's a lot of preparation. It's easier to eat out than eat in. Is that a myth or, or, or uh, talk to me about that a little bit? Well, I mean, the first thing is that it's very difficult to generalize about Chinese food. This is a yes. country that has been obsessed with food for like 2000 years or something. I mean, it's like <laughs> it, it, it's got a, a serious gastronomic culture and that encompasses everything from what you call Gong Fu Tai, which is like Kung Fu cooking, really elaborate, labor intensive, skilled cooking to street food and easy dishes that people just rustle up after work in the evening. So um, it's just, I think if you come, you know, it doesn't have to be difficult. It can be fiendishly difficult, but it can also just be very relaxed and easy. I think the challenge for Westerners in my experience, and it certainly was for me, like as a, as a young woman in London, I was already very interested in cooking. And after my first trip to China, I decided, you know, I wanted to try a bit of Chinese cooking, but I felt that it was a completely different system. Like the whole grammar of the cuisine was different from the sort of French English food that I was used to. The basic process is the ingredients. And so at first there's that little um, leap that you have to make. You need a certain few ingredients that you maybe wouldn't otherwise have. Um, mm. and a couple of basic processes, but then it's not very difficult. And actually the book you've got on the table there, Every Grain of Rice. So that book mm. is probably my most popular book, but that one was designed to just show people that you can just make really um, quick and easy and healthy and economical food um, in which mm. vegetables are the star of the show. Um, and, and it's been quite encouraging that a lot of people, I mean, friends of mine and also people who've written to me, that they've started with that. And there's literally a picture of the jars that you need to get, you know, the sauce, sauce and the vinegar to get started. And then once you have this little library of ingredients, then you can make, you know, most of the dishes. So, yeah, I think it's just, you, you, this, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I loved I loved flipping through here and getting ready for the, this chat with you today. Uh, Talk, talk us through the beginning of this book before we eat this delicious food here, uh, because you talk about the basics at first. If somebody wants to try Sichuan food, what's the basic things they first need to have in their kitchen, first in terms of ingredients? There's some basic things that you, you got to have in your kitchen. Well, for Chinese cooking in general, you want a decent soy sauce, you want a decent vinegar. And although in Sichuan, the vinegar they use is called Baoning vinegar from Langzhong, but actually Jinjiang vinegar from Eastern China is very widely available. And that's what I recommend for using abroad. Um, mm -hmm. You need um, sesame oil, um, you need Shaoxing wine, and you need ginger, garlic and spring onions, all of which you could get in any Chinese shop. Um, and then for Sichuanese food specifically, you need pisian douban, chili and broad bean paste, um, which is kind of the heart and soul of Sichuan cooking. And that's a sort of fermented paste that you sizzle in oil. And that's what gives that wonderful deep red color to dishes like mapo dofu and twice cooked pork. Um, and then mm -hmm. you need um, dried chilies and Sichuan pepper. And that's pretty much enough to get you started. That's what like seven mm -hmm. things, not very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. can make a whole lot of dishes. Well, very, very easy. But let, let's 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 do, let's do a deep dive for a second here. Okay, Shaoxing wine. 
I go yeah. into my Perkins shop or my welcome store here in Hong Kong and I go to the Shaoxing wine and there's 400 different types. I mean, what is Shaoxing wine? Can I use my Chardonnay from France for Shaoxing wine or do I, is it something special? <laughs> Well, okay, so Shaoxing, Shaoxing is a city in Zhejiang province, not too far from Shanghai, which has is very famous for its so-called Huangjiu yellow wine, this amber-colored wine. And now it's about um, the, the strength of um, sake or sherry, sort of medium strength. And you can actually use, at a pinch, sherry as a substitute, and that's what people uh -huh. use. <laughs> but, um, and I should say that, um, you know, there are very nice Shaoxing wines for drinking, and for using in dishes where it's the main ingredient, like some of those Eastern dishes like drunken chicken, where it's the main ingredient. But in Sichuanese cooking, the purpose of Shaoxing wine is to refine the flavors of meat and fish ingredients. Um, so what you do is um, always, Chinese people are very sensitive to what, what they call xing wei, which is the fishy tastes. And that's the slightly mm. less pleasant aspects of the flavors of meaty and fishy ingredients. So shaoxing mm. wine, you do something like you're going to steam a fish and you first rub it with a little salt shaoxing wine, you stuff a bit of ginger and spring onion into its belly and you leave it for a few minutes. And that purifies the flavor. Um, and it's one of those things that when you start with Chinese cooking, maybe it sounds a bit esoteric, you know, what does that actually mean? But if you compare the results, um, I think you really notice a difference. And it's the same as with um, making a stock with say pork bones or chicken bones. The difference between just doing it in water or adding a little ginger and spring onion is really great. Mm -hmm. So that's what okay. Shaoxing is for. And you just need it in small quantities. But if you haven't got it, I would say you can still go ahead and cook the dishes and they'll still be pretty good. <laughs> So, okay, a little bit of sherry or just go ahead without. And one more thing, when I go into my welcome or my Perkins shop, I see an awful lot of soy sauce. I, I walk in there and there's a whole shelf of soy sauce. What I, I only want to do, a, I want to try something, you know, Chinese, Sichuanese. What do I get? Dark, light, salted, unsalted? What do I do? Okay, well, I mean, this is a potentially very complicated subject. Broadly speaking, um, it's become very widespread, even in Sichuan, that the, 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 there is the light and dark soy sauce, which is more of a Cantonese thing. But the thing you need to know, really, is that dark soy sauce is much um, thicker and denser in colour. And that's what you use, really, when, when you want to give a sort of deep luster and dark colour to your dishes in sort of red braised dishes. Light soy sauce is lighter in color and, um, and that's used more as a sort of salty umami seasoning. So basically you're going to use light soy sauce a lot more than dark soy sauce. So if you're just gonna get one soy sauce, I would get the light soy sauce. I should say that the traditional soy sauces used in Sichuan um, before the arrival of the sort of Hong Kong brands were, they would just have jiang yu, just soy sauce, which is both quite rich in color and quite um, salty umami. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the main thing is that always go for soy sauce that's um, sort of naturally, traditionally fermented. And if you can get a premium soy sauce, some of the big brands do these premium soy sauces, and you will really notice the difference, particularly where um, in, in things like cold dishes and dips, where you notice the soy sauce on its own, it's always worth mm. getting those premium brands. Mm. Okay, and and one more last question about getting our kitchen ready to do this sort of cooking. I mean, what what utensils are absolutely essential for the home cook? I mean, I, I assume a wok, but what else? <laughs> I mean, it's possible to cook these dishes without any special equipment at a pinch, right? So you can use just an ordinary frying pan and you can use a normal sort of French style knife, okay. But for best results, a wok, and I always recommend a traditional, not a non-stick one, but a traditional carbon steel wok. Um, and that's really nice to use, basically indestructible. <laughs> and um, okay. I have the same wok that I've had for 25 years and I just love it. And it's just, <laughs> you know, goes on and on. Um, so that will help you. Now, if, it depends on the kind of cooker you have. If you have electric or halogen or something with a flat base, then you need a flat bottomed wok. 
However, mm. if you have a gas cooker or some induction cookers with what they call a wok cradle or a wok burner, so mm. it's a little frame mm. when you can put a round bottomed wok, that's really mm -hmm. ideal. And then you get the, the, you can move the food around easily and the flames lick around the base of that wok really beautifully. Ah. Mm -hmm. thing, I mean, the other thing that I can't live without is a Chinese cleaver. And that's another thing ah. that I think is a real cultural, culture difference. Yeah, yeah. but people, people in the West, if they haven't used a Chinese cleaver, they think of it as being a heavy butcher's knife. And while, of course, they do have heavy chopping knives, actually, the, the, the kitchen cleaver, cai dao, vegetable knife, is really very light mm. and thin, and you use it for everything. Um, so I would use my yes. cleaver. Yeah, um, it's, it's very, here. Yeah, it's, it's very safe. It's very dexterous. It's much lighter than you think. Whenever I do cooking demos, I always ask people to hold my cleaver afterwards to just see how <laughs> But if you hold it carefully, it's, it's, I find it much safer, actually, than a, a sort of European mm -hmm. style because you have this wall of metal protecting your knuckles. Mm -hmm. And the other great mm -hmm. thing about the cleaver is that you, once you've chopped up your ginger or garlic, you can use it as a mm -hmm. kind of scoop to move ah. things into the cooking pot. Mm -hmm. So those are the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the thing about the wok is that it's incredibly versatile. So you can use it for stir frying, you can use it for deep frying, you can even use it for a steamer. Now, of course, you can get mm -hmm. a bamboo steamer and put it in your wok, but you can even just put a little frame in the wok, put a plate of food on it and put a lid over mm -hmm. it. So you just mm -hmm. you don't really need very much at all. Yeah, and how do you clean your wok? Well, that's another thing that there's nothing to be afraid of. So normally, <laughs> If you have seasoned the surface well, which you do by heating it with oil, sort of rubbing it with oil and heating it very hot a few times. So you get a sort of a fairly good surface pattern there, and that's when the wok looks black in color. Now, um, for normal stir frying, if you season it with oil before you stir fry, the food shouldn't really stick. So you can literally just brush it. Um, I have a bamboo brush, um, but you can use any kind of brush to just brush out the wok. However, it happens to us all. Sometimes you don't season it properly and some food sticks to it. Or mm -hmm. if you've used it for steaming or boiling, you can strip off the patina and then you end up getting back to the metal. Well, all you do is you scrub it with wire wool if necessary. You scrub it back down, rinse it, and then reheat it and re-season it. And you're all good to go again. So I just think oh. all these things about, you know, never use washing up liquid. It really doesn't matter. I yeah. normally do, but I don't need to. But if I have to, I will scrub it down. And if I need to, I'll use soap and it's fine. It recovers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Any yeah. questions? We do. We have a question from uh, Christy Lou Stout from CNN. Uh -huh. She says a question about mouthfeel. For those not familiar with the concept, how would you define it and frame its importance in Chinese cuisine? And, and is the concept evolving as Chinese cuisine itself evolves? Is it becoming more or less central to the art of cooking? Okay, so mouthfeel, the English word is a literal translation of the Chinese kogan, mouthfeel, literally. Um, and it is um, an absolutely critical part of Chinese culinary culture and the appreciation of food. Um, and it's one, and I also think it's one of the most critical distinctions between Chinese cuisine and the cuisines of pretty much the whole Western world. Um, so when Chinese people talk about the pleasures of a dish, you will notice that they almost always talk about the mouthfeel as part of that, as important as the flavor and the appearance. And particularly in Hong Kong, because I would say that the Cantonese are acutely sensitive to every subtlety of kogan. So for example, um, yeah, like wontons, that you know, proper Cantonese wontons will be a bit springy and even almost like a kind of crunch to the meat and the prawns inside. Um, and a, a friend of mine in London who's been making wontons as a sort of pop-up, um, she said that some British people were sort of remarking that they thought the meat should be more tender. And she was like, no, they're supposed to be Cantonese, right? Um, I think that there are some... So apart from the fact that mouthfeel is, is, is a really important part of, of the pleasures of dish, 
the Chinese also appreciate a far greater range of textures than, say, a typical Western person. So there are a whole lot of textures for which the words in English just sound quite revolting, like gristly, slippery, <laughs> slippery, slimy, right? This all sounds disgusting in English, but <laughs> these are really prized and appreciated textures. And so there are lots of food. So, for example, like um, the, you know, the gristle in a chicken's leg, for example, is particularly delicious from a Chinese point of view. Um, there are many ingredients in Chinese cuisines which are which have no flavor but are eaten just for the texture of course they're eaten with nice sauces or soups or something. a good example is sea cucumber at the high end so a sea, good sea cucumber if it's prepared well the chef starts by literally purging it of every last vestige of so-called fishy flavor so you just have pure springy rubbery gelatinous texture and then you cook it in your beautiful sauce or your soup or whatever mm. Um, and this is, yeah, and then at the low end, for example, in Sichuan hot pot, you have goose intestines and duck intestines, which when I first tried them, I thought were just like rubber bags or elastic bands. I mean, like, why would you eat these things? Because the texture, <laughs> there, there is no flavor. And I, I think that's a kind of common reaction for people who don't grow up with these things, because we don't really have any equivalent. But um, so, but I think... Um, that, I mean, one of the reasons I've written so much about texture and I talk about it quite a lot is I think that if you want to really fully appreciate Chinese cuisine, you have to unlock this door to the appreciation of texture. It's not that there aren't millions of delicious things that you can eat without it. I mean, you know, there's plenty of Chinese food that doesn't require grappling with intriguing textures, but there's always going to be a bit that's out of bounds. And I think in my experience of sort of writing about it and talking about it, it's just something that many Western people have literally just never considered. So there's this sort of bafflement at why do the Chinese eat these things? And it's like as soon as you start to think, well, actually, it's because they have a very sophisticated culinary culture in which texture is an extra dimension of gastronomy. And that was my starting point. It was like, well, you know, I, I think that the Chinese really know how to eat and I kind of want to learn how to do that too. And so <laughs> it took me because I was sort of doing it blind. So I spent many years in China eating rubbery things and not really enjoying them, just being polite or just, just eating them because it was required. But I can honestly say now that I totally adore these foods and that, I mean, you know, like in Guangzhou a couple of years ago, I had some fish more, which is another of those slithery, mm. And I'm still dreaming about it. It's just like one of the most delicious things. <laughs> yeah, sea cucumbers, all these things. And I, I think that if you can, it's just, it's very interesting gastronomically. And if you can open your mind and your palate as an outsider, then you, you, you have the chance to really get something about, about Chinese food mm. that um, you may not have appreciated before. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Rebecca, is your mind open? I, I mean, I've eaten quite a bit of intestine in my time, and okay. I've, I've, I think I'm still at the beginner stage. I need to open my mind more. And um, just to like, do you, has that evolved? Like the importance of texture in Chinese cuisine is it is it something you've seen changing, or is it just a sort of you know one of the fundamentals in your opinion? I think it's absolutely fundamental, and um, I think I mean there's a, a, a sort of new mouthfeel word, word that has been. I don't know when it started, but shuang or shuangko, which evokes that lovely, refreshing, sort of bright, slippery, springy sensation in the mouth, which people say is a bit like the word cool, like it's new lingo <laughs> to describe something that is a, it's a, it's about the experience in the mouth of a nice food. So mm -hmm. in terms. Of Cavalry, but um, and I think that there are new foods which Chinese consumers have jumped on because they have interesting textures, like bing tao, ice grass, ice plant, which is this mm. supplement that I believe comes from Russia that looks as though it has little ice crystals all over the leaves. And when you bite it, it's seriously noisily crunchy. It's really, it's an extraordinary texture. And also okra, which is very slimy, of course, and that's something that's become very popular. So I think that um, people in, in China have, have um, yeah, they're finding new foods, but that the preoccupation with texture 
as part of food appreciation, I think is just a constant. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, before we before we sample these delicious dishes that are in front of us here, I have one more question, which is, am I making a faux pas? I'm drinking this with a Riesling. <laughs> what is the best drink with Sichuan food? Should I be having a beer? Is Riesling okay? Some people say sparkling. So what, what, what would you recommend? Well, um, so there are many choices. So um, if you're going to drink grape wine, then white rather than red. You don't want you don't want oaky whites. You don't want very tannic reds. So kind of lighter, fruitier flavors. Classic matches are Rieslings and Gewurztraminer. I sometimes actually like drinking Sauvignon Blanc just because it can be very uh -huh. clean and refreshing with such a nice food. Um, but also, yeah, beer um, is a nice casual drink. And also, surprisingly, like I've done some tastings with Scotch whiskey and uh -huh. it goes really well. And it somehow hits some of the spots that Baijo does, but it, it works kind of. It, I've done tastings where we've all agreed that it goes better with Sichuan food than brandy, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, you give me another excuse to break <laughs> out my Scotch whiskey. Thank you, Fusha Dunlop. This has been definitely a worthwhile experience here. But uh, <laughs> uh, the first dish that we're going to try here mm -hmm. is fish fragrant aubergine, which is made out of your cookbook here by our wonderful staff here at the FCC. Do you have anyone in front of you by chance, or are we going to have to? You're going to have to watch us eat it. I, I sadly, I'm tragically, I'm going to have to watch you eat it. Yeah, because it is one of my well, favorite well, dishes of all time. <laughs> well, it's it's one of your favorites, but you also write that this dish almost more than any other expresses for you the gorgeous layering of flavors that is the signature of Sichuan cookery. Can you explain what you mean by that, by the by the layering of the flavors here? And can you explain that while we're eating it? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, <laughs> With apologies. <laughs> I mean, everyone mm. says... Good. <laughs> wow. Delicious. Yeah, I mean, everyone says that Sichuanese food is hot and spicy, and that's the cliche, both outside China and within China. You know, if you're going to Sichuan, people, Chinese people will say, ni pa bu pa la, are you or are you not afraid of chili heat? That's the reputation. Mm -hmm. But actually, Sichuan mm -hmm. is a very subtle and exciting and varied cuisine. And they say, mm -hmm. yi pa bai cai bai wei, which means each dish has its own style and a hundred dishes have a hundred different flavors. Um, so some of the flavor combinations are spicy, like mala, numbing and hot, but some are not. Mm. When I was at chef school there, we learned 23 flavor combinations, which were like they, the sort of official flavor combinations. One of them is the one that you're eating there, yu xiang, fish mm. fragrant. Um, mm. and what, what it has that's so Sichuanese is you have a bit of spice from pickled chilies or chili bean paste. So that's your chili, but it's not mm -hmm. very hot. And you have this very seductive undercurrent of sweetness and sourness as well. Mm. And you also have the punchiness of ginger, garlic, and spring onion. So that's mm. the thing. It's a complex layered oh, cake with a bit of heat and sweet and sour mm. and sugary. And that's the beauty mm. of Sichuanese cuisine. And that is the skill of the chefs to make all these sort of bewitching combinations. Mm. The thing I found amazing about this one, because I, I have to out myself as a massive fan of yours, mm -hmm. um, but I've cooked this bit when I've had like vegan guests around because mm -hmm. it's completely vegan. And it's something that goes down like no one ever, like, you know, some vegan mm -hmm. food is very obviously vegan. This is just, it's, it's absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm used to Sichuan cuisine. Sometimes I go to restaurants and it blows my head off with the spice, but this was well balanced. Well, Absolutely the, perfect. Like, you know, one of the, the, the sort of slightly sad side effects of the immense and growing global popularity of Sichuanese food is that I think the dishes that have um, have grabbed all the headlines in a way are the ones that are really covered in chilies and Sichuan pepper and oil, like hot pot, like ladzaji, chicken with chilies, um, shui mm. juyu, you know, fish in a mm. sizzling bowl full of chilies and Sichuan peppers. Mm. These are all fun and delicious, but they're not they're not all of Sichuanese cuisine. And that dish, like fish fragrant eggplant, a very humble dish, but that's mm. for me much more about the spirit of the food as is eaten in Sichuan and an everyday sort of basis. 
And there's actually no fish in the fish flavored eggplant, correct? No, it's a it's a funny word, and and generally the consensus is that it's called that because it uses the seasonings of traditional Sichuanese fish cookery. And indeed, mm. like if you go to southern Sichuan, you have many fish dishes where they use pickled chilies, ginger, and garlic. And and strangely, fish fragrant flavor is is rarely applied to fish dishes. So it's you have fish flavored porks, livers, chicken, um, aubergine, but not um, fish fragrant fish. Mm -hmm. Wow, I, I have to congratulate, congratulate our FCC team in the kitchen for taking your cookbook and turning uh, your, your written words into this amazing dish here. So shout out to the FCC kitchen. I believe they're still going to be serving this over the next day or so. So if anybody wants to come in for St. Patrick's Day and, and order Sichuan food, it's there. That traditional pairing. But traditional, <laughs> exactly. But we've got a, we've got a, another dish we want to try here. It's got a bit of a funny name. Uh, we, we, a lot of people who know Sichuan restaurants know it. We call it Mapadofu. But what, tell us what that name actually means in Chinese, the Mapadofu. So literally, it means pockmarked old woman's tofu. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's meant very affectionately. And it's mm. named after a late 19th century Chengdu restaurateur. Oh, there it is on the right. Yes. Um, That's it. <laughs> so it's named after this woman called Mrs. Chen, who had a restaurant in the north of Chengdu at Wang Fu Chao, the bridge of, of um, 10,000 Blessings. And um, so the story goes, she used to um, cook up tofu for oil carriers on the way from the countryside to the markets of the city and became very famous for this dish. Um, it is actually one of the dishes that is listed in, um, there's a very interesting source published in 1908 or 9, Guide to Chengdu, which mentions um, Mrs. Chen's, you know, pockmark Mrs. Chen's mm -hmm. tofu. <laughs> so, and this mm. is another of those dishes which really expresses the heart and soul of Sichuanese food because you take mm. this really very humble, inexpensive ingredient. It's mainly tofu with a little bit of minced beef. Mm. And then you use these tremendously exciting seasonings to make the tofu into something kind of ambrosial. Um, and it's just one of those dishes that I found that even people who think they don't like tofu and they think of it as being some very dull food only for vegetarians, mm. most people just are seduced by this dish. <laughs> oh, it's, it's fantastic. What do you think, mm. Rebecca? I am one of those people who thought they didn't mm. like tofu until I tried this dish. Oh, so. fantastic dish. Mm. Uh, tell me, is this maza or laza? What's the difference between the, the those two? Oh, well, this is... So this is what you, I mean, in terms of the flavor combinations, this is a bit of ma la. Ma is the numbing flavor of Sichuan pepper. And it's interestingly, it's also the word for anesthesia and pins and needles. So it describes that sensation. Ah. That's ma. And la mm. is the heat of chilies. So it's a combination, mm -hmm. but it's also what they call jia chang wei, home style flavor, which means that mm -hmm. it's by, um, with the chili bean paste, which gives it that sort of rich, savory body and that lovely red color. Mm -hmm. And can this be made as a vegetarian dish or is this always with the, uh, the ground beef? So, or? so in fact, the recipe, and it may be this one, the recipe in every grain of rice is a vegan version. So I often I make it at home without any meat and the, the flavors mm -hmm. of the other ingredients like the fermented black beans and the chili bean paste are so exciting that you don't really need the meat. Some people use, um, you, you know, mushrooms or even vegetarian mints instead, but you can just omit mm. the meat. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's an actually another excellent dish if, you, if you're entertaining vegan or vegetarian friends. <laughs> oh, then absolutely fantastic. I can't tell if my mouth is numb or on fire. It's fantastic. <laughs> It's and, got you good know, Szechuan pepper then, if you've got it. It's got the good Szechuan pepper there. You know, a lot of people, uh, especially here in Hong Kong, my friends, they say, oh, I don't want to go to Sichuan. It's too hot. It's too spicy. But it doesn't have to be, correct? No, not at all. And, and this is the other thing that I think um, so much of Chinese food is about the art of ordering. Like um, a, a good, a well-planned menu is always balanced. And so if you have a really hot dish, then you have some dishes that are not. And the whole purpose is to leave you feeling 
not only satisfied, but very shuffu, very comfortable and well and kind of rested afterwards. So if mm -hmm. you go to a Sichuan restaurant and every dish on the table is electrifyingly spicy, I would say that's not really a well-ordered meal. The exception perhaps is Sichuan hot pot, um, which is you know, a very spicy meal. But actually, even with Sichuan hot pot, you often have a so-called yunyang hot pot divided in two with one mild soup. And you'll usually mm -hmm. finish it with a sort of sweet snack or some fried rice or some porridge or something like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think, and, and also it's just, um, you know, it's a question of what you order. Okay. And, and we've got one more dish of yours that we want to try here uh, for our audience at home to salivate. And for you in London to salivate, uh, it's got a, it, it also has a funny name. Huiguo Ro, it means the, the pork is coming back home again or something like that, according to my bad Chinese. Huiguo <laughs> Ro, well, why is the pork coming back again? <laughs> Where's it, yeah. Where did it go and then why is it coming back? <laughs> well, Huiguo, so Guo is, in this case, is pot. So it's back in the pot pork, Huiguo Ro. And uh -huh. um, I've translated it often as twice cooked pork. And what it is mm. is pork that is first boiled and it's got to be really fatty pork. So ideally rump or belly is also very nice. And yeah. um, so you first cook it and you just let it cool. And when it's cool, you cut it into slices and each slice should be a really good mix of fat and lean. Yeah. And then you sizzle the pork in oil. And so all that lovely luscious fat comes out and it should get a bit sort of goldeny. And then mm -hmm. you add your Jiachang, your home style seasoning. So you add chili bean paste and fermented black beans and a bit of tian mian jiang, fermented sweet wheat sauce. And so you mm. get those rich savory mm. taste. And then you finally add a vegetable and you can add leeks or um, garlic sprouts or peppers. Um, and that mm. is kind of, um, that is one of the most popular and best loved Sichuanese supper dishes, home dishes. And I remember mm. once writing an article for um, American Gourmet magazine about three high level outstanding Sichuanese chefs. And I interviewed them all separately. And at the end of each interview, I asked them what their personal favorite dish was. And they all said it was Hui Guo <laughs> which gives you an idea. Ah. Of how popular. And also it's what they say, it's very xia fan. It really sends the rice down. So if you're just going to have one dish, that's enough for a meal. It's got meat and vegetables with a bowl mm. of rice. It's just delicious. It is fantastic. What do you think? It's amazing. Um, I actually have a question a from question. the audience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to eat while you ask the question. Um, <laughs> this is about the previous dish, actually, but I think we can allow mm. it. Um, from Ian Marlowe. I've been making mabo tofu for years, but I'm wondering what's the best type of tofu for making it? Mm. Okay, well, the, the thing with mapo tofu is that you want the tofu to, to stay in cubes, right? But you also want it to be beautifully tender and wobbly. So the ideal, it's, it's hard, there's not a sort of international scale of tofu firmness, so it's a bit difficult to be precise. But mm -hmm. if, if the tofu is too firm, so that it keeps in very, you know, in very firm cubes, you don't get quite the beauty of the mouthfeel. If you, at the other end of the scale, silken tofu, of course, is so tender that it falls apart. Um, I would say, I mean, the tofu I use at home is I would go to a, a Chinese shop and buy the kind of tofu that comes in soft blocks in water. And you can even give it a prod through the packaging <laughs> and you want it to be a bit wobbly. And um, yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, it doesn't, you can make it with any kind of tofu and the flavor will be good. But for the mouthfeel, that, that sort of sweet spot between um, holding its shape and melt in the mouth is what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, if, if you can say that food is a gateway into the soul of a city or a soul of a people, I mean, what does, what, what does Sichuan food say about the city or about the people of Sichuan? What does it tell you? Well, I think um, the thing about Sichuanese food and particularly these dishes is it's very unpretentious. This is not high level banquet cooking using sort of fancy pansy sort of expensive dried seafood. This is using everyday ingredients that you can find in your market. Um, and Sichuan is 
you know it's it's seen as being a place where it's all about folk culture and lao bai xing you know everyday people mm. the food is mm -hmm. not expensive something like those aubergines which is just a very very low level dish and it's so delicious um, and also for me it's this kind of warmth in all these lovely red colors and the, the gentle heat and um there's, you know, Sichuan, Chengdu has a, a reputation in China for being a really Xiuxian Changsha, a leisurely city where people just like to laze around all the time, chatting and playing cards and mahjong and eating lovely food. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think, you know, this is part of the character of the place. And that's why it's such fun. You know, that's why people, you know, enjoy spending time there. I mean, but is, is this the kind of food that I would only get in someone's house or can I go out anywhere and eat this in, if I'm in Chengdu? Yeah, well, I mean, they have um, these dishes you, you will find in many restaurants. Um, they're also, I mean, particularly the elder generation. So my friends, parents and grandparents could make all these dishes completely beautifully. Sadly, a lot of younger people are dining out more, eating more takeout food and just not cooking them as much. Um, mm -hmm. But they're, they're sort of the kind of, you know, in a more traditional household where, where people cook traditional dishes, exactly these kind of dishes. And also um, one of, you know, my favorite sorts of restaurants really in Chengdu are the Tsang Guans, are the fly restaurants. Um, it's a bit like the English greasy spoon. So it's a kind of joke that they're supposed to be really unhygienic. Or something, but it's not true. But um, yeah, so these very casual restaurants where they will have a menu of these sorts of dishes. And this is still, I mean, that's where I fell in love with Sichuanese food in the 90s. And these are still in a way my favorite places. Mm. Hmm, interesting. And Rebecca, do we have any questions from the audience? We do. We have another cooking question um, oh. from Eric Wishart. Eric uh, Wishart. Oh, yeah. oh, wait, wait. I think he's Scottish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the vice president of the FCC. He's the vice president of the FCC. He's... I can tease him for being Scottish. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> he says, what kind of oil should you use for Sichuan and other regional cuisines? Because there are so many possibilities. Yeah, well, I think um, so definitely don't use olive oil <laughs> you oh. want to have an oil that has a high smoke point because you'll be doing some stir frying at high temperatures and you also want an oil that's not too assertive that's not going to give a lot of unwanted flavor that will carry the flavors of the seasonings so the traditional Sichuanese oil is taizio rapeseed oil and that's made with toasted rape seeds. And it is this lovely oil, which has a slightly roasty flavor. Um, but so this is the traditional oil, but it's really hard to get abroad. I can't get that lovely toasty Sichuanese rapeseed oil um, in England. So I tend to use just a good neutral oil. So um, brown nut oil, um, rapeseed oil, as long as it's not that very grassy, as long as it's sort of refined. Chinese chefs will use soy oil as well. Um, but um, yeah, a, a neutral vegetable oil is the best with a high smoke point. Uh -huh. um, we have another question. Um, in recent years, a debate has opened up about cultural appropriation. What do you make of the term and how do you view your relationship with Sichuanese cuisine after so many years of sharing it? Well, so cultural appropriation has come out of the whole sort of reckoning about a system that's seen as being very unfair, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's all about, it's brought all these concerns about respect for other cultures and about representation of diverse people in the media, right? And these are all very important questions, but I think, I don't think the solution is that you should be confined to the food from your own heritage. And I really think that it's important for everyone that some people travel to foreign countries, learn other languages and immerse themselves in other cultures and become a kind of bridge. So I feel that at the moment, there's a lot of sensitivity about, for example, um, you know, white people writing about cultures that are not their own, and that there's a reason for that. But I think that the sort of healthy endpoint would be a place where, not where only Chinese people write about Chinese food, but where Chinese people, if they want to, will write about Italian food as well. I mean, for me, that, you know, and I, I do very much feel that 
you know, the work that I've done has felt like a collaboration with people in China. Um, and funnily enough, although I never really expected this, quite a lot of the people who use my books are actually Chinese. So it's not a very straightforward one way traffic, I think. And um, in fact, the books, um, Charlottesville and Sichuan Pepper, and now the Sichuan Cookbook are actually published in Chinese for a Chinese market, which is stunning to me because I always thought I was writing really for people outside the culture. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. we are where we are, but um, I do think it's healthy to, to have a lot of exchange and bridging mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Fusha, you, you, you've written a lot about uh, Chinese uh, Sichuan cuisine. You've got a couple of books out, but you've also written about other areas. Hunan, uh, for example, you've written about other areas. I mean, tell, tell people the difference for a moment just between Hunan and Sichuan, because people sometimes think they're very similar because they're both spicy, but they're both they're different, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that they, they both get saddled with the spicy label, but actually, so having worked for many years on Sichuanese food, I then decided I wanted to write a book about Hunan food. And um, I, I, I was absolutely shocked when I went to Hunan because it was completely different. Um, and so just, just a few of the differences. So we already saw like with the fish fragrant flavor, that undercurrent of sweetness in Sichuanese dishes. But in Hunan food, they don't tend to mix sweet and savory in the same way. So there are some sweet dishes and sweet snacks, but you don't have that sweet element in most of the savory dishes. Um, they really like, they don't use Sichuan pepper really. So they use chilies fresh and pickled. They love spicy chili taste. They love sour taste. They love salty tastes. Very, very different cuisine. Um, and I think too that just, you know, these are just two, two provinces of, of China. And the thing that is still incredible to me is the absolutely endless diversity of Chinese cuisines. I mean, there are attempts to classify it by saying there are four great cuisines, roughly North, South, East and West. You're in the sort of Cantonese South area, right? Sichuan is in the spicy West. Um, and then there's another scheme, which is eight great cuisines, which is a bit out of date, because I think it, it recognizes cuisines like Anhui, which is another province, which is not really very well known now. Um, uh -huh. But I think the, the, the truth is that this is a country of um, not only pretty extraordinary biodiversity, um, so the, the range of ingredients used in all these different terrains is just extraordinary. And even within somewhere like Yunnan, it, quite incredible the number of, of plants and so on um, but also because it's a, a culture in which food is tremendously important people have expressed this creativity in just doing everything you can think with every possible ingredient available to them and so you know I've been traveling around China and specifically focusing on the food for 25 years or something and I'm still going to places where I'm discovering whole new styles of cooking, new dishes, new ingredients. It is totally incredible. Mm -hmm. On that, we actually have an audience question about Uyghur cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, a few years ago, you wrote that you managed to find the real deal in London. What? What do they serve? How has it been received? And can you recommend any dishes that you could make at home? Wow, Uyghur cuisine. <laughs> Yeah, well, there is like, there are very few Uyghurs in London, but there's one restaurant called Etles, which is run by a woman um, who came via Turkey several years ago, but is fluent in English, Mandarin, Uyghur and Turkish, incredibly. And so she has um, some of those classic dishes, so handmade noodles of various types. Um, she does the da panji, the great plate chicken, which is actually not a traditional dish, but is very popular now. And um, the Samza, you know, the, the local equivalent of Samosa. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a small place, but with wonderful food and it's been quite popular. So I, I would say that it's kind of put that style of cooking on the map in a way that it wasn't before. Mm -hmm. Is there one cuisine that you wish uh, were more known on the international stage? And, and our friend Christy Lou Stout mentioned Jurjang food, for example, which she apparently loves with their yeah. you know, long tea shrimp, et cetera. I mean, what do, what, what do you wish people knew more about? Well, actually I did a book about the food of Jiangnan, including Zhejiang and Jiangsu provinces. 
Um, so that's the area, if you're not familiar, just inland from Shanghai. And that is an extraordinary region, which is not very well known abroad, partly because it resists easy categorization. So there isn't a label just like spicy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's got, it, it's one of the sort of centers of China's gastronomic culture. So that's where you get through the ages, most of the important food writers. Um, these sort of gentlemen scholars who've written recipe books or who've written poems about food. Many of them came mm. from the Zhejiang region. Um, it's particularly rich in culture. So you get um, many, many dishes with stories and legends attached to them. Um, and also um, ingredients that are very specifically local. And that's perhaps another reason why it hasn't become well known abroad, because things like hairy crabs, I mean, I know you can get them sometimes in Hong Kong, hairy crabs and specifically weird and wonderful fermented foods from Shaoxing, for example. I mean, that's one of the most exciting places I've ever visited in China. So they have this, um, they do all these, I mean, everyone knows about stinking tofu, but they do what they're called sort of stinking amaranth stalks. Um, <laughs> anyway, mm. just like these amazing, funky fermented tastes, which I totally love. And anyone who likes nice. sort of really farmhouse Ooh. French cheeses, I think, would um, would enjoy that region. But I think that, I mean, I think the thing is that although, the, you know, appreciation of Chinese regional cuisines in the outside world has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. There's just so much more to discover and quite, there's not that much information available in English about it really, relative sure. to And uh, one more question from me, which is, you know, when I go to China, I haven't been able to travel anywhere <laughs> in the last uh, year or so because of the pandemic. But when I was in China last, I see a lot of people lining up outside of KFC and McDonald's and there's all this Western fast food. I mean, are people going to still know how to cook these amazing dishes at home in another generation or is that being lost? Um, well, I mean, I think that it is being lost to an extent in the way that it, ha it has globally, but in, in, sen in the sense that there are lots of options. People are busy. There are many options both for takeaway food and delivery and also sort of halfway food. So maybe you make mapo tofu, but you buy all the seasonings in a packet. So you're not really mm. making it from scratch. So I think, and, and also people, so I would say that for younger people in China, sometimes cooking may become not a daily necessity, but a leisure activity. So only this morning I was exchanging messages with the translator of my books into Chinese and she's been doing sort of elaborate French baking. So I'm here in London making Sichuanese food yeah. and she's there in Chongqing making some, you know, layered French <laughs> you know, tart. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, do, I, I find that, you know, as I said, the, the, the generation of parents and grandparents they not only know how to cook all these dishes, but they can make their own pickles. They can make tofu from scratch. They are so skilled and the younger generation are losing that. So when I've done things like, you know, book tours and talks in China with young people coming, I am <laughs> imploring them to learn from <laughs> their parents and grandparents because it is like a huge wealth. And it's also, I think, um, apart from being economical and pleasurable to cook your own food, it's also very healthy. And um, so I really, really hope that people make the effort to hand down these traditions. Pusha Dunlop, before we let you go, tell us, please, what are you reading these days? Either cookbooks or fiction or children's books or whatever you recommend for our FCC members and guests and friends and audience here. What are you reading these days? Well, for some reason, I've been going through a sort of um, early 20th century Beijing phase. And um, recently I read Twilight in the Forbidden City by Reginald Johnson, who was the British tutor to the last emperor. And I've had it on my bookshelves for years and for some reason picked it up and I found it completely gripping because he was a real insider 
and um, at a very interesting period of Chinese history. And it's a just extraordinary book. Sadly, um, probably like many British colonial types, he wasn't that um, interested or, or eloquent on the subject of food. So we don't hear anything about what he ate, which is just funny, but it's a wonderful book. And then following on from that, um, a friend recommended City of Lingering Splendor by John Blofeld, who went as a young man to Beijing in the 30s and 40s and fell in love with the city in the, in kind of in the way that I, I mean, it reminded me of being young in Chengdu. And um, he had a wonderful time, met very interesting people. And also, thankfully, he really liked eating. So he writes about going to eat Peking Dark and, um, you know, other local food practices. So I just found that an enchanting book and very interesting historically as well. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh... Thank you, Rebecca, for joining me and helping me share this beautiful cuisine. Thank you for our FCC amazing staff here, including Benny behind the camera here. Well, thank you, and, uh, I'm gonna say thank you, thank you to your <laughs> absolutely. Thank, thank you for the them. ones who the ones who supplied the wine as well. Uh, Fusha Dunlop, uh, Sichuan cookery, but released re-released as the food of Sichuan in a new version twenty years later, and also every grain of rice. Thank you for joining us, Fusha Dunlop, craving Sichuan food while in lockdown in London. <laughs> and thank you all of us for joining us here at the FCC. Uh, we'll see you back uh, for our next event. And again, uh, I'm going to go home hungry, but I think I might sort of eat some of this stuff later. Thank you, Fusha. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all, everybody. Yeah. Make this stuff at home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd better get some myself now, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank Bye. you, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>